Well, hey, Forefront, it's good to be with you guys this morning. Happy Fourth of July. Everybody have a good Fourth of July weekend so far? Yeah. I want to say welcome to those watching from home, tuning in online today. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Hope you guys had a great Fourth of July weekend as well. If you've been with us the past few weeks, we've been spending some time uh, looking at Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically the last few weeks we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer and seeing that Jesus tells us what it looks like to, to pray. And so it's been really amazing to, to spend some time seeing what it looks like to pray like Jesus. And so we're going to continue to do that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's grab those and open up to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Well, a few years ago, Courtney and I decided that we wanted to go whitewater rafting. I don't know if you guys have been whitewater rafting before, but we had never been, so we, we thought it'd be quite the adventure, and so we found an outfitter outside of Canyon City uh, down there by the Royal Gorge, and we went down and went whitewater rafting, and, and uh, you know, here's a picture uh, of us before we went, and, and I, I watched a few YouTube videos before we went, so I felt like I knew exactly what I was going to need to do. I uh, had just watched that, that Kevin Bacon movie. Do you guys remember the Kevin Bacon movie, uh, The River Wild? So I, I knew what to watch out for. Watch out for people that bring pistols with them on a raft, right? And, and we were ready to go, and so we went down there, and I was really excited and expecting some some serious, some serious rapids, right? So we get down there, and the place we went was actually pretty tame. It was pretty tame, so I got to be honest, I was a little disappointed. You know, there was no series six rapids. Nobody was thrown from the raft. I didn't have to rescue anybody with an oar. You know, I was really looking forward to that, but actually, it was really great. We had an amazing time. I don't think I could have handled any series six rapids anyways, But, but it was really good, and when we got down there, there's that moment, you guys have all seen it before, when you do anything, there's that moment when they give you the safety spiel. You know what I'm talking about? When you go in and they're going to say, okay, here's what you need to watch out for. You guys are going to go on these rapids. Here's the obstacles to look out for. Here's going to be the challenges. And then they always tell you, hey, you know, if you're pregnant or you're six foot ten, you know, you might, might not consider going on this raft. And I was neither, so I was like, let's go. I'm, I'm ready to go. And so they start telling you what to, look, what to look out for, where to put in, where to get out of the raft, and what happens when you fall, if you fall out. And, and they gave you this really good tip. They said, if you fall out of your raft, don't try to put your feet down. Instead, kick your legs up and put your feet above the water, because that will help center you, and then somebody will be able to grab you and bring you back into the raft. And I thought, wow, that's really good advice, right? So now I know what to do if I fall out. Now, thankfully, nobody fell out. Everybody was good. We went on a nice, easy, easy run, and then we went and had pizza later, right? It was just like a really good day. But I, I was talking with a buddy who lives in Canyon City, and he was telling me, we were talking about that experience, and he was telling me why they tell you to keep your legs up. Do you guys know this? So the reason is, when you fall out of your raft, your tendency is to put your feet down because you want to stand up or you want to try to catch yourself. What happens, though, is your feet can, can get jammed under a rock. And when your feet get under a rock, you're going to go straight under the water. And, and I thought, wow, that is really good advice. And it helps you be prepared, evaluate your situation, and be prepared for the obstacles of life. And, and I just think that's a really good tip for life. Wouldn't you guys agree? That whenever we move into or out of new seasons of life or new adventures or new situations, we should be prepared. We should know what obstacles are coming our way. And I think for many of us, we do a pretty good job at this in some areas. You know, maybe you're looking at changing careers, you're looking at, uh, at taking a new job, or you're looking at growing in your career, and you, you know in that moment you're going to do the research, you're going to research the company. You're going to research the role. You're going to ask the right questions. You're going to ask, what's, uh, what are some of the challenges with the position? Maybe, maybe you're putting your kids in a new school or your grandkids. You're signing them up for a summer program. And in that moment, you want to know every situation. You're going in and sampling the lunch, right? You're making sure the, sh the pencil sharpeners work. You're doing all these things to make sure everything, is, there's no surprises, that everything's good. Now, while we do good at this, at some areas in life, there's a few areas in life that we could get better at. You know, when you think about managing the obstacles and knowing what's coming our way, I think one of the areas that we don't do a very good job for a lot of us is just ourselves. Knowing how we ourselves need to navigate the uncertain waters around us and to be 
prepared. And you just think about the life experiences that we go into and the you know, challenges with relationships or with finances or with our help, with our health. A lot of the time, we, we might be really prepared for, for certain situations, but when it comes to us, we're, we're not. We blindly walk into situations. We aren't sure what the obstacles are. And what happens is we end up getting thrown out of the raft and we try to stand up and our feet get stuck under a rock and we go underwater. So I, I want to know, how do we get better at this? How do we as people get better at navigating the uncertain waters of life? How do we as people become better prepared? I believe Jesus would tell us it's through prayer, that we find this preparation through prayer. We've been spending the last few weeks looking at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus has really been trying to help shape, really reshape the way we think of prayer. And I don't know about you, but I think a lot of time, a lot of the time, when we think about prayer, we think about prayer as something you do at certain times. You know, you say grace before you sit down and eat, right? You, you say your bedtime prayers. You, you pray when you get to church. Or, or prayer is this um, kind of this, this motion you go through where you go ask God for the things that you want. You say, God, I've got this list of things that I'd like you to do for me. Here's that list. And we, we often think of prayer this way. And I think what can happen is prayer becomes very routine it becomes very mundane, and we're just going through the motions. But Jesus wants to challenge the way we think about prayer by telling us the Lord's Prayer, by saying that there's a model to prayer that can help drive us to the real meaning of prayer. And if you were with us two weeks ago, we started off by looking at the Lord's Prayer by saying that Jesus tells us to, to direct our eyes to who we're praying to. You guys remember that? We talked about we're praying to our Father who is in heaven. Holy is his name. And Jesus is that when you change your prayers... To, to realize you're praying to your Heavenly Father, who is the one that spoke everything to an existence, into existence and is in heaven, it changes what you pray for. And it allows us to begin to start to pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, and, and in my church, and in my neighborhood, and in my workplace, and in my city. But last week we talked about that, that we, we start to, in that prayer, we start to, to look to God for what we need. And, and so Jesus tells us to pray for our daily bread. If you guys remember what we talked about last week, it's the idea that Jesus is calling us through prayer to trust our Heavenly Father. That God knows what you need more than you know. And so it's through prayer that we learn to trust. It's through prayer that we learn to trust that God is going to give us exactly what we need. And this morning, as Jesus rounds out the Lord's Prayer in verses 12 and 13, we're going to see that he tells us that to be prepared for the obstacles of life, prayer has got to be our main focus, that it's through prayer that we can prepare for what's coming our way. So I want to dig into this, and there's really kind of two headings I want us to think about this morning. And the first one is that, is that when we pray, we, we pray uh, for forgiveness, and, and what that does is it helps keep us in tune with God. And, and secondly, that when we pray for guidance, it helps us see the obstacles that are ahead. So if you have your Bibles, let's read the whole Lord's Prayer together again this morning. It's uh, going to be Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to be in verses 9 through 13. Let's read together. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says, Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together this morning when we can come, gather around your word, join together, and, and uh, look at what it looks like to, to pray like Jesus prayed and to, to uh, see prayer as that main way that we connect with, with you, Father. And, uh, and I pray this morning that you'll just open our hearts to help us to see that, that prayer is the main way that we learn to navigate the uncertain waters around us, that we learn to be prepared for the obstacles that come our way, and that you give us prayer as that connection point for us to connect with you and for you to just continue to uh, lean in and, and teach us, help us to become the people 
that you have created us to be. So Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you for this weekend that we can celebrate the freedom that we have in this country, that we can freely come together in this room today and and open our Bibles and sing songs to to praise the name of Jesus. I know many of our brothers and sisters around the world can't do that, and so I I just thank you for the freedom that we have. We know we live in a, a great nation. It's a nation that's far from perfect. But, but it, it's, a, it's, it, it's a great nation, and it's a nation where, where we can come together as one. And, and so, Father, I pray that you help, help us just to, to treasure that. But, but more so, Lord, help us to remember that it is in Jesus Christ that we are free. That, that as sons and daughters, uh, uh, as your sons and your daughters, that we are free. We are freely forgiven. We are free to become the people that you have created us to be. As Jesus says in John 8, um, 36, that if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And so, Father, help us to really wrap our hearts around that together this morning. Father, I pray that as we look at your word, that we leave today looking more like Jesus than when we came. And it's in Jesus' strong, holy, magnificent, incredible name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. So here we are, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. So imagine that you are out in the mountains and you're going to go hike in a trail and you're standing at the trailhead or maybe you're out on the trail and you pull out your map and you're trying to figure out where you're going. And you're trying to figure out how you're going to get back to your car. What are you looking for? When you're standing at that trailhead, you're looking for that little red dot, aren't you, that says you are here, right? You guys ever been in that situation trying to find your way home? Maybe you're at the mall and you have to return something, or in my case, you're trying to find the food court. And you're looking at that map and you say, where am I at? You are right here. That's going to help me navigate my way to my final destination. See, in the Lord's Prayer, this is what we see, that the Lord's Prayer is this map for us. And it's through prayer that we can look and find out where we are. We can see that we are here, and there is where we want to go. Because it's important, because we need to be able to figure out where we are and where we're going so we can navigate the obstacles. If you're on that trail, and you're trying to get back to your car, but it's an eight-mile loop versus a one-mile loop, you need to know that, right? That's important. And so prayer is really the roadmap in which we can identify where we are and determine which way we need to go. And you'll notice here, in this prayer, that Jesus gives us some, some really interesting, um, some really interesting concepts, and there's really two I want to dwell on this morning, and the first one is this, that praying for forgiveness keeps us in tune with God. So if we are to learn how to navigate life, and we are to learn how to be the people that God has called us to be, then it starts with prayer. And it's praying for forgiveness that helps us keep us in tune with God, to help us see who we are and, and how we need to live and what God has for us. So Jesus really is calling us here to pray for forgiveness. You know, if you look at the Lord's Prayer and you, you really see, you know, Jesus gives us really three aspects to the Lord's Prayer when we're talking about what we're praying for for ourselves. I don't know about you, but sometimes we can think about prayer as this involved thing that's just, there's just so many moving parts and all of these things that I need to try to remember to pray about. And, but Jesus makes it so simple. He says, you pray for God to give you what you need, you pray for God to forgive you, and you pray for God to lead you and guide you. Like, Jesus gives us this model and says, hey, prayer can be this beautiful thing that you connect with God over, and God gives you exactly what you need and helps give you that direction. And, and as you notice here, this focus on forgiveness, it's really important. Notice, notice what Jesus says here. Look, right after the Lord's Prayer, look at verses uh, 14 and 15. Jesus goes back to forgiveness. He says in verse 14, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts. We've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 14, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Notice, Jesus hits, he goes circles right back to show us how important this concept of praying for forgiveness is, that this idea of praying and confessing our hearts and our sins to God, it's that important. He hits it twice. Now, you might read that and you might think something's missing. You, you might read the Lord's Prayer and you think there, there's a verse that's missing out of here. If you grew up reading the King James Version of the New American Standard, you're wondering, where's the 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, right? Where's that, that verse at? If, if you've got a New American Standard Bible, you're probably looking down and you'll notice that second half of verse 13 is in brackets. How come it's not here? Well, there's a reason for that. So I know you guys are all chomping a bit trying to figure out where the second half of verse 13 went. So um, when the uh, translators put together the ESV, they made the decision to not include that verse. If you notice, it's in brackets in certain translations. That means, anytime you see something in brackets, that means that it's not found in the original copies. And so you guys may not realize this, but let me give you a quick little history lesson. We have so many copies of the Bible that we can, with 100% accuracy, determine what the New Testament authors wrote. We have over 25,000 copies of manuscripts, copies of writings by the early church fathers. I mean, 25,000 copies of manuscripts. It's incredible the amount of um, copies that we have, and we can look back and see with accurate detail what it was that Matthew wrote, that John wrote, that Luke wrote, that Paul wrote. It's, it's amazing. Actually, the oldest manuscript copy that, that we have on record is a copy of the book of John from 120 A.D., from, the, from about 120 A.D. That's incredible. So what the Bible scholars do and the translators do is they'll go back and they'll look at the oldest copies they have on record. And what they found is, here in the book of Matthew, that phrase, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, didn't come in to copies of manuscripts until about the 200s. And so that's why some of your translations will put it in brackets and some will leave it out. Did Jesus say it? He absolutely could have, but we're not 100% sure. So that's why the ESV leaves it out. Does that make sense, guys? And so is it okay to say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever? Absolutely. It's a doxology at the end of the prayer. Because if you notice, Jesus almost leaves it a little bit open-ended at the end. And so it helps round it out. So feel free to say that. But if you're wondering, chomping at the bit, why is it not in the ESV? There's your answer. So you guys can all go home now and, and feel good. I know you were concerned about that. So, but you see here that Jesus is really telling us that forgiveness is key. Now, forgiveness is so important that he emphasizes it a second time. N notice with me, look back at, at verse 12. Notice what Jesus says in verse 12. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. He doesn't say sins. Your translation may say trespasses, but the ESV uses the word debts here. That, that's an interesting use of the word. When you think of debt, what do you think of? It's a financial term, right? You maybe think of student loans. You think of that mortgage payment you have to send every month. Maybe you go on vacation, you spend a few too many dollars on the Discover card, right? There's some debts there. Debt carries this idea that there's a cost associated with it. So Jesus is telling us that when it comes to sin, there's a cost associated with sin, that sin is, it does never have, sin is never by itself, that there is a debt to be paid. You know, I don't know if you think about sin like that. I think we often think about sin as just this bad mis this mistake I made. This bad decision I made. Maybe I missed the mark. I didn't do what God told me to do. But Jesus says it's, it's more than that. Sin isn't just a, an oops. Sin carries with it a debt that needs to be paid. When I was in high school, my, my dad decided that it would be good for me to start building some credit. And so he got me a credit card. And I thought, oh, this is a great idea. You know, I'm going to be able to buy the bare essentials that I need. I'll be able to buy gas for my car and some Doritos and some Gatorade and a new pair of shoes, right? Some movie tickets. Next thing I know, I got like $225 racked up in like two weeks on this credit card. And so comes time for the bill to come out. The invoice comes out. So I get the bill in the mail. And my dad just casually walks over to me and hands me the credit card statement. He says, okay, son, here you go. 225 bucks. It's due on the 20th. And I just thought to myself, like, I thought I had like $20 on that thing, right? You, you quickly forget how fast things can add up. You quickly forget, get a little loose with that debit card, how, that credit card, how fast the balance can rise. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us here about sin. That when we sin, it can quickly grow just like a credit card statement can grow. Your sin can compile on top of each other. And what happens is it gets 
in the way and it, can, it, it messes with our connection with God. Sin gets in the way and it, it blocks the communion that we have with God. And so that's why we need to address it. Just like the mortgage company expects you to send your check, just like the credit card company is expecting that bill to be paid, God is telling us that if we don't address our sin by confessing it to God, then we're going to find ourselves in a place that we don't want to be. So Jesus is saying here that we need to address our sin, and the way we address it, it's through prayer. It's through praying for forgiveness. Now, you might hear that, and you might think, wait a second, Drew, hold on. Doesn't the Bible say over and over again that when I put my faith in Jesus, I'm forgiven? That, that God knows my past, present, and future sins? Doesn't Paul say in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, that we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and our sins have been forgiven by the richness of God's mercy? Yes, absolutely does. We know that Jesus fully knew when he came here and went to the cross for us that he paid the penalty for our past, present, and future sins. All of that is wiped clean. What Jesus is talking about here in the Lord's Prayer isn't anything about our relationship with God positionally. You, we are still sons and daughters of, uh, of God. We, once saved, always saved, right? We're, we're, there's no fear that sin is going to separate us from God. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. But what Jesus is talking about here is, is the connection that we have with God, that when we sin, that when we allow sin to compile in our lives, it separates us from our communication and our connection with God. It gets in the way. So Jesus says, by calling sin debt, that we need to keep short accounts with God, that we need to keep short accounts with our heavenly Father. A quick moment of honesty here, you don't, don't raise your hand. Just give me like a little in, internal hand raise. When is the last time you guys balanced your checkbook? For some of us, you guys are like, yesterday. I did it yesterday. Thank you, right? Good Fourth of July activity. For others, it's been a while, right? Now, I think for the most part, a lot of us get online and we, we you know, keep a budget and we manage our expenses and make sure the mortgage payment was paid or light bill went in and net, Netflix, right? Spotify, you got to make sure those are getting paid. But for a lot of us, maybe we're not as faithful as we know we need to be. How about this one? Has there been a time when you were scared to log on to your online banking because you knew it's been a little while since you've been on, you've been a little loose with the debit card, and you're afraid what you're going to see when you log on? I think we've all been there, right? You just think, I don't really want to get on there. It's been like a month since I've seen what the balance is, and I just don't even want to (laughs) see what it is. I know I've been there. Why do we get that way? It's because I think we know there's things out there that we really don't want to see, and we're afraid what the actual result's going to be. And I think sometimes that happens with prayer, that we, we have maybe been getting a little too close to something. We've been uh, kind of dabbling in or letting some sin sneak in on us, and now we are a little bit afraid to go to God and pray because of what we're going to have to say, of what we're going to have to confess, because it's gotten pretty ugly, and it's compiled on each other. The bill has gotten pretty steep. But see, I think that's why Jesus is telling us here that we need to daily pray and confess our sins, because that is where we pay the bill. That is where we go and get it off of our chest and make sure that that connection with God is where it should be. I, uh, I, I love what um, John Stott says. He, he talks about this idea uh, of praying for forgiveness as being so essential to us. John Stott says this. He says that forgiveness is as indispensable to the life and health of the soul as food is for for the body. I mean, just think about that. Like, the the fact that we need forgiveness, that we need to continually confess our sins to God and be forgiven of those sins is so important to us. It's, It's the currency in which we live by that if we don't do it, our souls get thirsty and they get hungry and they get weak. Maybe you've been in a place this week where you just, you're tired. Your soul feels dry. You feel a little worn out. Could it be that you've been letting sin get in the way and you haven't been giving that to God? You have not been coming to God and confessing that sin to him regularly. Jesus is saying, if we're gonna know how to navigate the obstacles of life and be prepared for what's coming our way, we have to continually be praying and asking for 
forgiveness. Sin racks up a bill, but prayer is where you pay that bill. Notice what John says in 1 John 1, verse 9. He says this. He says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and able and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you hear that? John is telling us that, that when we go to God and we confess our sins to God, that he's, just gonna, he's, he's, he's faithful every time. He's going to forgive us of our sins. He's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, isn't that amazing? Just think about that. You know, you go out and rack up some credit card debt, you've got to pay that bill. You go and let sin sneak in, guess who pays the bill for you? Jesus does. Now, it's not freelance, free reign to go sin and do whatever you want, but it's the reminder of how amazing our relationship with Jesus really is. That he loved us so much, he came and gave himself for us. So, so Jesus is telling us that, that sin gets in the way, it gets messy, it messes up our, our, our relationships and our connection with God. So we've got to be confessing it because as we pray for forgiveness, we stay in tune with our Heavenly Father. We stay in tune with God. And it's through prayer. It's not through effort or trying to be good. It's through prayer. But not only that, praying for forgiveness also is where you learn to accurately see yourself. Notice Jesus saying here that, that, that we are praying, forgive us our debts, and we also have forgiven our debtors. I don't know how, any of you guys uh, fans of the Dave Ramsey show? A couple of you guys. When Courtney and I go on long car rides, we like to put on podcasts of the Dave Ramsey show. You know, and, and if you've listened to the show, you know people call in and ask Dave Ramsey questions about finances and how to get out of debt and what to do with their investments and, and it can be pretty entertaining sometimes but maybe not every show but every so often there's somebody who calls in and their family followed Dave Ramsey's plan for how to get out of debt and they're financially debt free and so they call Dave and they say Dave you know we want to we let you know that we're completely out of debt and Dave will say, well, how, how much money did you have? And I say, well, we had 150000 in debt. How long did it take you to pay off? It took us three years. Dave's like, congratulations. Are you ready? And they do the debt-free scream. Have you guys heard the debt-free scream? They're like, three, two, one. And they yell, we're debt-free. And then the, the Braveheart, you know, Mel Gibson from Braveheart comes over top. Freedom, right? It's like it's this amazing moment. Like hair stands up on the back of your neck or on your head if you have it, you know. It's just makes you want to be there, right? You're just thinking like, man, I want to be debt-free so I can call in and scream that scream because it's so good. There's just freedom in knowing that you don't owe anybody any debts anymore. And this is what Jesus wants us to see through the Lord's Prayer is that when you know Jesus Christ, you are completely free. You are completely forgiven. You know, Paul says in Romans 8, 1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. John 8, 36, that who the Son sets free, he is truly free. We know when you trust in Jesus Christ, you've been forgiven all of your sins. And now Jesus just tells us to have a conversation with God every day and just ask for forgiveness. Just confess it. It's, it's almost like having that debt-free scream would be pretty great, but we almost need a, 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 a soul-free scream every day, right? When we're coming to God in prayers like, God, I am free. Because when we remind ourselves of that truth, it changes us. It changes who we are. It changes how we think. It changes how we treat other people. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. Look back at verse 12. He says that we are to pray, God, forgive us of our sins, of our debts, as we also have forgiven others who have sinned against us. See, Jesus is saying that when we're in tune with God, it helps us become in tune with other people. See, the, re the reality is, Jesus wants us to see this, the reality is that forgiven people are forgiving people. That when we realize we've been forgiven by God, we then become forgiving to others. See, you, you may know somebody or, or maybe even yourself right now. You've been in a situation where you're just really having trouble forgiving somebody. Maybe somebody did something, hurt you, and, and maybe they've even said they're sorry and asked for forgiveness, but you're just really struggling with forgiving them. Maybe it, it, it's, it's, it's even yourself that you're having trouble forgiving. And, you know, I, but I think what Jesus wants us to see is when we realize how forgiven we truly are, it changes us to become forgiving people. 
You know, Jesus is the king of the parable. Jesus loved to teach parables, and when he did, he often taught them to the extreme. And so just a few chapters after this Lord's Prayer in Matthew 18, Jesus gives us the parable of the wicked servant. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Some of you may know this parable, but in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives us this parable of the unforgiving servant to the wicked servant, and and here's the story he tells. He tells us that there's a king, and this king is ready to settle accounts. So he calls in his employees, and he's settling their accounts. They've got debts that need to be paid. So he calls in a servant who owes him 10,000 talents. Now, we don't use talents, thankfully, right? But some of you might wonder, what's a talent? Well, Jesus, again, likes to go big with his parables. So 10,000 talents is about the equivalent of $7 billion, just to give you guys a reference point. Jesus goes big, right? Go big or go home. Jesus always went big. So Jesus says, he call, the king calls in his, his employee who owes him seven billion with a B and says, okay, it's time to settle up. Well, the, the, cert, the, the employee says, well, I can't settle up that big of a debt. And so the king says, well, I'm going to throw you in jail until you can. And in that moment, the employee says to the king, the servant says to the king, hey, show me mercy. Be patient with me. I'm going to pay every cent. And in that moment, the king shows him mercy and clears the debt. Seven million bucks, debt cleared. Beautiful, shows God's love, mercy, grace. But then the parable goes on. Now the the employee who has just forgiven $7 billion goes down the road. He sees somebody that owes him money. He owes, this person owes him 100 denarii. That's about $40, okay? He was forgiven 7 billion. This guy owes him 40 bucks. This wicked servant goes, demands his 40 bucks. The guy says, I can't pay it, and he throws him into prison. And so the king hears about this, and the king calls in the servant, the employee, and says, you wicked person, I just forgave you $7 billion, and you can't forgive this guy 40? You're going back to jail, and you won't leave until you pay every cent. And Jesus is trying to drive home, he's talking to the Pharisees here, but he's trying to drive home to us this concept, we have been forgiven so much, that we have been forgiven (laughs) all of our sin that Jesus came and gave his life for us. We are forgiven and we are free. And because of that, we need to be forgiving other people. There's really no excuse for us not to be forgiving people. Jesus finishes with this, Matthew 18, 35. And he closes the parable with this. He says, just like the king threw the man back in prison, he said, so also my heavenly father will do every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. See, Jesus is trying to get us to have an accurate view of ourselves, of who we are, and how as forgiven people, we need to be forgiving people. But he doesn't stop there. He also moves on in verse 13, and he tells us this. There's a second aspect to this idea of really navigating life and the uncertainty before us. He says this, not only do we pr- we pray for forgiveness because it keeps us in tune with God, but also we, we should be praying for guidance because praying for guidance helps prepare us for the obstacles ahead. Just like when you're out on those white water rapids and you don't know what is before you or what lies underneath the water, prayer is where we pray for that guidance to give us the direction. Look back at verse 13. Jesus says this. He says in verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's part of the prayer is, Keep me from temptation. Lead me not into temptation. Guide me away from temptation. Now, this is is really an interesting verse because if you take it at, at, at first glance, you might wonder, is Jesus telling us to pray that God doesn't tempt us? Because that's kind of how it sounds at a little bit at first. But I think James helps us understand what Jesus is saying here. James, the the brother of Jesus, says this, James 1 verse uh, 13 through 15. James says this. He says, let, let no one say that when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desires. Notice that. That, that God isn't the one that tempts us, that we are being tempted by our own desires. Keep going. What happens when our desires get tempted? It says, then the desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to what? To sin. And when it's fully grown, it brings forth death. You know, Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin are death. And, and so James is saying that, that it, God doesn't tempt us. We're tempted by our own desires. And when we give into this, when we fall into sin, it leads us to a place that we don't 
want to be. So I think a better way to understand what Jesus is saying here, maybe a better way to translate this in English would be this. God, help me stay away from temptations. Just pretty simple prayer. God, help me stay away from temptations. Because I think every one of us would agree there's temptations around every corner. There's temptations all around us. And the more time you have that cell phone in your pocket, the more temptations exist. And so Jesus is trying to get us to have this mindset that we need to be prepared to stay away from the temptations. John Stott paraphrases this verse in this prayer. He says this. He says, we should be praying, God, do not allow us to be, to be led into temptation, to be so led into temptation that it overwhelms us. That we realize that there's going to be temptations around, but we've got to pray that God directs us so we don't be overwhelmed by those temptations. Just one chapter before this, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says some pretty interesting things about pulling your eyeball out and cutting off your hand. And if you've read that before, you know it's a little strange. Jesus isn't a masochist, right? He's not saying do self-harm. But what he is saying is that we need to know what our temptations are and we need to stay away from them. So you need to know what the challenges are. You need to know what's pulling your eyes and your heart away from God, and you need to stay away from those things. So maybe a modern-day example of what Jesus is saying is, if you know that going to a restaurant or a bar is going to cause you to drink too much, don't go. If you know that going into a casino is going to cause you to want to try to gamble away all your money, don't go. If you know that going to the Cheesecake Factory is going to cause you to want to eat 10,000 calories of cheesecake, then just order one curbside delivery, right? Let's go get one, take it home, you're going to be all good, Right? Jesus is saying, just know your surroundings, know your obstacles, know your temptations. I read an article this week about Tiger Woods, arguably, you know, one of the greatest golfers of all time. And it said that Tiger Woods, before he gets to his shot, he visualizes how he wants to hit the ball and where the ball is going to go. So he's visualizing the swing, he's visualizing the backspin, he's visualizing the placement. And it's just this idea that he is mentally preparing himself for what he's going to face. And, and if you've studied much about neuroscience or, or the science of the brain, it finds that when you go through the, the, uh, the, the mental exercise of visualizing what you're going to do, it is almost as beneficial as the physical activity itself. They, they've, they've done t- countless studies on this, and they found that it's true. And so what Jesus is telling us is that prayer is that avenue in which we are visualizing how we are going to navigate the uncertain waters of life. That prayer is where we learn how we're going to avoid these obstacles. And it's praying that God leads us away from temptation. And in those moments, we learn how to say no and how to navigate it. But not just that. There's, there's something that we need to see here that I don't want to miss. There's something we don't want to overlook. Look at verse 13. See, our temptations aren't just our desires. There's another source. When Jesus says in verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from what? From evil. In the Greek, there's a definite article in front of evil, which means Jesus is saying the evil one. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the evil one. He's talking about the devil. He's talking about Satan. And I know we get a little uneasy when we talk about the devil sometimes. We kind of are afraid to sometimes talk about the devil because we are afraid it's going to make us look weird, right? But let's just be honest here. If Jesus talks about it, if Jesus believes it, it's legit, right? It, it's real. And Jesus is telling us that there is more going on here than just our desires are being tempted, that there is a spiritual war going on that's trying to pull you away, and we need to be prepared for it. And prayer is where we prepare. Prayer prepares us for those obstacles ahead of us. You know, Peter says in in, in 1 Peter that the devil, that Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with spiritual forces of evil. Like this is a, this is, Something we, have, we can't miss. We have to, we have to understand that the, the way that we navigate these, the, the spiritual warfare that's around us, it isn't by trying to be strong enough on our own or trying to have enough willpower on our own. It's through prayer. 
It's through looking to God and knowing that God is the only way we're going to be able to stand strong with the arrows that the devil's going to shoot at us. And so we're praying, God, guide me away from temptation, but protect me from the evil one. God, help protect me and help prepare me. I want to kind of close with this. I, I don't know if you guys remember this. How many of you guys remember the show American Gladiator when we were kids? American Gladiator. Oh, so good. Love the American Gladiators. Kind of the precursor to the American Ninja Warriors, right? The show that's on now. But I love the American Gladiators. These guys and, and gals were so tough, right? They were, they were just so great. And my favorite of all the obstacles that they faced was the jousting. I don't know if you guys remember the jousting, but it was great. Like, these were some great battles. And, and you would just see these two gladiators going at it on the joust, standing on like a gymnastics beam, and neither of them would fall down for minutes. And you think, how could they be so good? But you realize it's because they were prepared. They knew what their weaknesses were. They knew what they needed to do. And they stood strong in the face of that obstacle. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to get us to see in the Lord's Prayer, is that it's through prayer that we learn to prepare for the obstacles in life. And it starts with keeping that open line of communication going with your Heavenly Father, praying for forgiveness, asking God to help us forgive others, and then trusting Him that He's going to lead us away from the temptations of life, and He's going to protect us and give us exactly what we need. You know, I'd, I'd say today, here in this room or to some of us watching online, we're in a season of life where we feel like we've been thrown out of the raft. We, we've been, we're in a season of life where we feel like the unknown obstacles around us or maybe it's been we've fallen back into a sin that we've struggled with and we've battled with for years and years and we feel like it's just all hit at once and now we've fallen out and we're, we're swirling around in the rapids. We're trying to put our feet down to get our balance but we keep getting our feet stuck under the rock with our heads getting pulled underwater and we feel submerged. But I think what Jesus wants us to see is even though that naturally happens to us, that it is through prayer that we can learn to keep our legs up and to trust that he is going to pull us back in the raft. That it's through prayer that we learn that Jesus is going to give us, that our Heavenly Father is going to give us exactly what we need to navigate the obstacles of life. It's prayer that prepares us for what lies ahead. But no amount of willpower will ever truly prepare you. Only looking to God will do that.